So what's new in Vardin 24? Well, we got Flow 24, and we will also cover what's what's new specific, specifically in Hilla. So to summarize, in Flow 24, we got a new technology baseline, baseline with Java 17 and and so on. We got faster build times in development mode. We got simplified theming. We got a really cool handy component locator. We got support for doing native image compilation. Uh, we got some improvements to the spreadsheet component, some updates about Polymer support, and finally also a little bit about the observability kit. So let's just jump straight in. The really big main thing with with Vardin 24 uh, is, is this new technology baseline. So it, it started when the spring guys said that, hey, we will start doing working on Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6, and that will be based on Java 17. It will be based on Jakarta Servlet 6, Jakarta EE 10, and so on. And, and we quite quickly realized that, yeah, well, we will follow suit here also. So we then started aiming for Vardin 24 and, and Hilla 2 to also use the same technology baseline. What this means? is that uh, these uh, Jakarta updates, they are not just kind of simple version upgrades all the time, because uh, because the way uh, Java EE turned into Jakarta EE, it also changed the uh, Java API namespace. So the packages are nowadays Jakarta.something instead of Java X.something. And if you're directly using those APIs, which many of you probably use, for instance, through through uh, JPA with, with uh, for instance, Hibernate, then that will also lead to, to a bunch of compilation errors for you. They are easy to fix. You just update the imports in almost all cases. But what it also means is that you need to run your application on an updated version of, of an application server. And that might, in some cases, be requiring a little bit of extra effort. At the same time, no worries if you can't update right away but in 23.3 which is the latest in the 23 series it will be supported for another year until march 2024 uh, for free and then if you got a prime enterprise or ultimate subscription then you are covered until uh, 2027 so that's a couple of years already and then beyond that also uh, even longer with extended maintenance also worth noticing that uh, actually Spring Boot ends support for free even earlier than that. So that's already happening in November this year. So that might be an even more urgent reason for you to update if you're using Spring Boot. More related to this technology baseline. So we're also updating the, the browser support and, well, as mentioned, the application servers. So uh, with the evergreen browsers, the browsers where you kind of automatically always just keep updating to the newest version, Chrome, Firefox, and, and Edge, we keep supporting the latest version and probably a couple of versions back, but no kind of definite uh, version numbers there. Since they, they keep updating all the time. Uh, we also support the latest extended support release for Firefox. And then with Safari, it's uh, 14 or newer, uh, 15 or newer, which is actually uh, an increase since since Vardin 23. On mobile, it's the same story with, with evergreen Chrome versions. And then on iOS, it's version 15 or newer. And basically because Safari and iOS itself have the same version number, so they stay in sync. With application servers, basically anything supporting Servlet 6 and optional also Jakarta EE 10 should be good to go. Listed here are the versions that we explicitly test with for now. So that should be covering most, most of your needs. Like you see, some of those only have beta versions out now that support these latest uh, Jakarta versions, but they will quite soon also get, get stable versions for those. Finally, there are a couple of technologies that we have to leave behind because they do not support uh, Servlet 6 or Jakarta EE 10. So OSGI and specifically Caraf, 
uh, we are waiting for an update there and when it comes we will add support for that also with portlets uh, currently nothing kind of in store there so it might be that the portlet specification won't even be updated but we'll wait and see and react when when there's any news there then with ser servlet containers or application servers Oracle WebLogic hasn't been updated in a while. We have no idea about if there will ever, ever be a Servlet 6 compatible version of that one. Same also with uh, Apache Tom EE. That one might very well be updated still, but for now it's it's not not supported because again, lack of support for for these new technology baselines. With that. Time for some more polling questions. Over to you, Kim. Great. Thanks, Leif. All right. Let's move on to the next polling question. So you've seen now some information about the technology baseline. Just a quick uh, preview, similar baseline for Hilla as well. Um, so I want to get a sense for your organization. What do you think will be the effort in moving the applications you have built to this new technology baseline? Is this going to be a high level of effort for you, moderate level of effort, or minimal level of effort? And I'm kind of encompassing not just the, the Vaden update to the new version, but obviously that you're going to have to update those dependencies. So again, if you want to go ahead and pick your option there, once you have picked it, hit submit vote um, so that you can see the results and we can see how you guys are looking at this. Uh, so right now we're seeing that 38% uh, of you are saying a moderate effort, uh, about a quarter-ish, just under, saying high level of effort, 22% not sure, and 17% minimal effort. Okay, great. And if you have comments about like why you think the level of effort is high or even moderate, um, we don't have the chat on, but you can use the questions to just put a comment in um, from your perspective. That would be interesting data for us to have. All right, let's go on to one more polling question before we continue. Um, so the third polling question is, what will be the biggest challenge for your organization in moving to this new technology baseline uh, for Vaden 24 and Hilla 2? Um, so you can check more than one. Uh, so is it the update of Java to Java 17 or beyond, um, adopting the new Jakarta namespace, uh, moving to the new versions of Spring Framework and Spring Boot? Is it the lack of support that we have yet for OSGI or Portlets or WebLogic? Uh, just the time and effort to make the changes, the time or effort to test the application or other, and you can add notes or not sure. So again, once you pick at least one, you can pick multiple and hit submit vote. Then you can start to see the answers that other people have put in as well. And here we're seeing so far the top couple are just really the time and effort to make the changes and to test your application. 22%, uh, just a little bit less moving to the spring six and spring boot three and 14% moving to Java, and then the, the Jakarta, Jakarta namespace. All right, thanks for that information. Back to you, Leif. Thank you. Uh, actually, I realized I forgot to say that uh, it's Java 17 or newer, so, so we also we test with the latest Java version, so that's, that's basically Java 20 right now, and also we'll, we'll keep updating, so you can always, always use the latest Java version. You don't have to be be kind of stuck to Java 17 if, if you don't feel like that. Now let's move on to the actual kind of, so to say, improvements, because this technology baseline, while, it, while it's big and influential and so on, it's also, like we discussed here, it's a little bit of a problem until you get over the hurdle also. But there's also some, some new features to make things uh, work the effort for you, not just for having the latest version, but also to actually make your lives easier. So the first one uh, is faster build times. And I think this is a really, really great one. I think it's even my kind of favorite new thing that we add in, in Vardin 24. So 
what this means is that you no longer need to start the VIT or Webpack development server every time you launch your application in development mode. This also means that there's kind of there's no need of downloading npm packages and there's no need of even installing node.js on your own machine if you're just using the the built-in components uh, that that come with Vardin. And even if you add third-party add-ons and so on, you only need then to run run those front-end tools the first time when you when you have made that addition or updated a version or something, but then that creates your own custom uh, development mo mode bundle that you then can commit as part of, of the application itself so that then everyone else in your team, they just check out that, uh, that bundle that you committed and then they don't need to, to uh, even again have, have no JS installed and so on. If you are uh, building lots of lots of actual building front end stuff like with with templates or building your own uh, components as part of the application and so on, then you might want to disable this feature so that you actually use it to get kind of hot redeploy every time you make a front end file change, then you immediately see the result. But if you are kind of just every now and then making some updates, then definitely this new new way with with the bundles is is a really great improvement to you so actually if we look at this example video of of running vadin now with vadin 24 we see that well it takes it takes a while for the, in this case for the ide to compile but once it actually starts it just kind of one two three seconds and now you already have the application up and running whereas with with previous versions it was kind of usually 10, 10 seconds to just get it started. And if you needed to update uh, NPM modules or so on, then, then it could take minutes. Next up is a simplification to how you theme your application. So what, what we now introduce is using standard regular CSS syntax. This is a new-ish feature in CSS that uh, each individual web component, since basically the components, they encapsulate their own styles to avoid kind of accidentally being affected by other parts of your CSS. But that also makes it a little bit more difficult to actually make changes to how the internals of the components are styled. So what's now possible with these colon, colon, part feed, uh, se selectors in CSS is that uh, each individual component, for instance, this text field, it exposes different parts of itself that you can target with CSS. So you can write a CSS selector, for instance, to target the label part of the text field, even though that's inside the encapsulated shadow root. And thanks to this, you get uh, easier, easier way of, of writing CSS because uh, now you can put all your styles in one one style sheet. You don't need to have kind of separate files for each individual component. You can still do that if you prefer to structure things that way, but uh, you also have the possibility, or it also becomes easier to share styles between different, different features and so on. It also means that you can use more kind of just regular standard CSS. You don't need to, to, to use those special solutions that we, we introduced because because the browser specs weren't up, up to speed for what we needed. It also means, for instance, that when you, when you want to have something uh, work differently depending on which parent it inside, then now thanks to this part, you just can use regular CSS for that. Previously, need, you needed to do a bunch of, of weird workarounds. So, so that's also improved. You don't need to worry about this host and slotted and so on. Uh, kinds of selectors anymore, except again in special cases. And then finally also, we, uh, as part of this same effort, we, we also clarified the documentation for actually what are all the things you can style. So now here taking again the text field as an example, in the documentation you can see, see kind of pre predefined CSS selectors for how you style, for instance, the the clear button or the 
native input element inside the the button and uh, the text field and so on. Next, as mentioned, the component locator. So this helps you in the in the debug tools that you have uh, when you run Vardin in, in debug mode. There's now, uh, as we see in this video, uh, you can find the debug tools in the lower right corner there. And there you have a component locator. You can pick any component there. And when you click it, then Vardin will actually open in your IDE, open the line of code where that component is, is created. So that helps you really easily navigate around and find find actually w where different parts of the application is, is implemented. Mm. Next, uh, we got native image compilation. Uh, this is enabled through uh, improvements made in Spring Boot. Uh, and we integrate with that. So we, we basically make it so that all the Vardin related metadata about everything that the, the head of the time compiler needs to know all of that is available through Spring Boot so that uh, then when you use that support to, to build a native image, then you get something that just works out of the box. So why do you want to do this? Well, uh, I mean, in, in many cases, the regular Java hotspot just in time compiler, it's really, really awesome, but it, it has the drawback that it's a little bit slow to start up and it uses a bit more memory than what is uh, kind of absolutely necessary. So what you can instead do is to build a native image which compiles your Java application into actual native code for uh, for your CPU instead of uh, Java byte, byte code. So that means that it's faster to start up and it uses less memory, but instead one drawback is that some use of reflection is not needed because again uh, this is heavily optimized at build time and it also means that actually building this takes quite a long time because it it does lots of analysis to make those native images really really optimized at build time since it cannot rely on the just in time optimization that happens with with the regular java runtime so with this uh, you will typically be able to build a Vardin application that starts in way less than a second. So maybe not single digits milliseconds, but kind of tens of milliseconds is, is quite reasonable for, for Vardin applications using uh, native compilation. Next up, uh, we got some updates to the spreadsheet component. So that one was, the component itself was added already uh, a couple of versions ago. But now we also made it so that you can embed charts inside your spreadsheets and you can uh, embed Vardin components in those cells also. Uh, and that, that basically brings the spreadsheet component uh, on par with what, what was in spreadsheet for Vardin 8. Next, uh, a little bit about Polymer support. So we used uh, we, we, in, in Vardin 10 and, and 14, there was support for using Polymer for building application templates. We deprecated that in Vardin 18, since we had already then good experience with lit templates that are faster, simpler, more, more modern. You can still use Polymer for kind of your uh, reusable web components and so on. So this only affects the Polymer template class in Java and the Polymer uh, based template renderer for, for, for instance, the grid component. So starting from Vardin 24, those classes are no longer available, except that we still keep them uh, as an add-on for Prime and Ultimate, uh, and, and actually also Prime, Ultimate and Enterprise customers. At the same time, to help you move away from, from Polymer templates if you're still using them and, and don't want to keep using the kind of backwards compa compatibility add-on, we also provide a free conversion tool that you can use to, to at least do the lots of, of the kind of bulk work with, with upgrading your Polymer templates to use Lit instead. If you're using more complicated fe uh, advanced features, from Polymer, then you might need to do some manual adjustments also, but the tool at least should should make the, the kind of the simple cases work automatically for you. 
Finally, the last flow related feature we have is uh, update to the observability kit. So this is a quite new addition that we made. It lets you integrate a plugin with observability tools like Datadog, Grafana, Jigger, Prometheus, New Relic, and so on to give specific data about what goes on in the Vardin part of your application. And now starting from, starting from this release for Vardin 24, we also add support for Vardin 14. Uh, Vardin 23 was also uh, supported from before. And also kind of related, all the acceleration kits and also all other parts of that were kind of included in Vardin 23. They have obviously also been updated for 24. But these were just the highlights. There's a long, long list of, of smaller enhancements and fixes and so on. Just mention here a couple ones really quick. So uh, Testbench has been updated to support JUnit 5 also. You can also use JUnit 4, no worries there. But from now on, we definitely recommend using the newer JUnit 5 uh, test engine instead. We added a SVG component for adding inline SVG content in, into your application. We made some enhancements to how, how validation works for field components, like again, the text field or date picker and so on. This is to better keep in sync validation status between the client side and the server side. Finally, one final small highlight for Grid Pro, if you're using a custom editor, now we added a value provider there so that you can actually convert the data before before actually showing it in the in the editor. So those were the enhancements for for the Java only part of Vardin, so so the flow part. And then now on to Hilla. So that's in Hilla version two. Mm. Again, a whole bunch of, of different things here. You got the same new technology baseline. We got an improved TypeScript generator. We got web socket support for reactive endpoints, the same simplified theming that we looked at, the same native image compilation as for Flow, and uh, SSO kit for Hilla also as a new, new acceleration kit. Just as with uh, Vardin 23, also Hilla 1, or more specifically 1.3, it's supported until March next year for free and then for prime and above it's uh, until uh, 2027. And here also the reminder that actually when you're using Spring Boot, which you always use with Hilla, then free support for, for that from, from the Spring team that ends already in November 2023. So here you might have a little bit more urgence to either upgrade or to also talk with the with the spring spring team about getting getting commercial support for their their platform. So again, nothing new here. This is exactly the same as with Flow. New technology baseline, Java 17, Spring Boot 3, and and Jakarta EE 10 being the highlights. No, no really different than than what we already discussed with with Flow there. But Unique to, to Hilla is a new improved TypeScript generator. So that's the part of the Hilla framework that takes your, your Java types and uses those to generate a TypeScript that helps glue the, the front end and the back end together. So with this new generator, we get support for multi-module projects. We got support for other JVM languages, most specifically Kotlin. Uh, we get support for uh, customizing how your T TypeScript types, so basically the beans that you send back and forth over the wire, how those are customized, because now we can also support uh, most of the Jackson annotations. So you can, for instance, rename properties in, in the JSON representation and so on. All of this is based or possible thanks to this new generator that reads the bytecode in the class files, which means that again, when you have a multi-module project, you only have the class files available on the class path. And now thanks to being able to read those, we can also generate TypeScript based on those. The same with Kotlin also, because it can read the generated bytecode instead of only the source, it's possible to support Kotlin there. Though there's a couple of 
special cases with co with how Kotlin generates both code that still needs a little bit of work, but at least the the basic stuff is is there now. Next new feature, reactive endpoints. We had this as a feature flag for quite a while, and now we think that it's ready for for general usage also. So what this means is that when you have an endpoint that returns a reactive data type, like a flux or a mono, for instance, then that's generated into slightly different TypeScript. So instead of just kind of doing, doing a method call and getting return value back, what you actually get is an object where you can do on next to subscribe to updates to that flux. So then whenever the, something new is published to the flux on the server, then immediately there's a web, WebSocket connection opened automatically by the framework. And over that connection, it sends the message to the client side immediately. So you don't need to be pulling for updates there. Then we got the same Graal VM based native image support as with Flow. So it works exactly with, as like I described with, with Flow there, you get faster startup and, and lower memory usage and in most cases, all you need to pay for that is slightly slower uh, compilation times. We got the same simplified theming because again, the, the components, the grids and text fields and buttons and all those, they are the same between Flow and Hilla. And, and these improvements are, are also then available for Hilla users. And then finally, as the last new feature, for Hilla, we introduced SSO kit. We used to have also, or we previously had a kit for Flow, and now we also have, have the similar kind of kit for Hilla. So what this means is that it gives you a really, really easy way of integrating basically any open ID Connect single sign-on provider. So for instance, Okta or Keycloak or Azure Active Directory, all of those really easy to, to integrate with, with your Hilla application. Uh, so that you you don't need to worry about keeping those up to date if if Okta or Keycloak or whatever you use is updated and so on. We take care of that. And we also do the more kind of difficult parts of, of the Open ID Connect standard. So not only can you log in, but you can actually also log out in a good way. And even with uh, what's called back channel logout, which means that if you log out, through the single sign-on provider, then that also automatically invalidates your session in the uh, Hilla or Flow application. So that was the last feature update for Hilla. And now I think it's time to hear from you again. Thanks, Leif. So we're on to our final polling question. Um, so again, go to that polling tab or icon. Here we just want to see which of the features that you've heard about you're most excited about in the latest release. Um, so these are all listed here and you can check as many as you want. So we talked about simplified theming with that uh, part selector. We talked about the component locator, embedding charts and components in spreadsheet faster build times and native image compilation for Flow, the observability kit for Flow, which also, by the way, now su supports version 14 is the biggest change there. Uh, Hilla reactive endpoints, Hilla native image compilation, okay. Hilla in the SSO kit, or none of the above or don't know. So if you want to check all of those and then submit your vote, we can see the results. Yeah, this okay. is a really tight race. Simplified yeah, theming tight and race. flow has been jumping back and forth between the first place. The simplified theming, uh, just over a quarter of you, and VOD and flow faster build times, similar amount, uh, followed by the component locator. Uh, but a good portion of you, or a significant minority, let's say, are interested in native image compilation and the reactive endpoints within Hillup. All right. It seems like we're actually missing the peel up, up, uh, new TypeScript generator. Yeah, there. I realized that I created this poll before that got added to the slide deck. So we yeah. are missing that item. But but if you love that one, you can put that into questions. And just by the way, we've had a couple, three questions come through. So we will um, 
come back to those in a moment, but I want to let Leif uh, talk about what's coming up next, and then we'll get back to your questions. Well, we can actually take a couple of questions okay. now and then then see if there's more questions later okay. on. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's so, see. Go ahead. Why don't you jump in? Yeah. Well, first we got, well, that's just a comment from Florian saying that they are limited by the customer limits the application server. So unfortunately, they cannot upgrade. Yep. I know. It's, <laughs> it's unfortunate. And, and I mean, it's... It's always for us also, it's a struggle because we, we definitely, we must stay up to date, but at the same time, we, we have this, this sympathy for, for people who are for different reasons, not able to upgrade. So, so yeah, we, we hear you there. And Florian, if you want to note and send a question about, or note about what application server it is, that would be interesting as well. Yep. All right, we have a question from Mario about simplified theming. Yep, so uh, can we stay on the old CSS like colon host and so on after the update also? Uh, the mechanism itself will still work. Uh, there were, when we enabled these features, basically enabled the part selectors, we did a couple of small changes to, to the CSS selectors for some of the components. So you might need to do some upgrades for those specifically, but that's probably less than, let's say less than 5% of all the, all the cases. So you can mostly keep using what there is, but there might be a couple of ones, especially I think related to the date picker. We made a couple of, of breaking changes there to be able to, to support the, the new structure. Hey Leif, are those changes noted in the release notes? How could uh, Mario find out if they might impact him? Uh, yeah, well, through through the release notes, uh, there's also a link to the upgrade guide, which also covers covers all these cases. I I hope I actually haven't checked, but I have a faint memory of seeing something like that. Okay, check the upgrade guide then. Yep. Then oh no, questions keep coming in. Should we maybe take one more, and then we will talk a little bit about what's ahead, and then we will take the rest of the questions and then you also get a little bit of time to, to submit more questions in between. Okay. So uh, actually, I think this is a question for you, Kim. Matthias wonders, will there be a way to get access to observability kit with a pro license? Mm, interesting. So right now to get observability kit, uh, you do need a prime license, but what I would suggest is to reach out to your account executive and you know see what options you might have. All right. So let's remember where we were in the list of questions and then go to a little bit about what's next. So we don't stop with Wadin24 and Hilla2. We actually plan to do, do, do more, more improvements also. So uh, what's upcoming? Uh, we are doing one feature release every quarter and the next one being then in June. And that would be then Wadin24.1 with Flow and Hilla 2.1. What we're working on for that is, uh, well, these are the highlights. Uh, we're doing new theme editor, or not new theme editor, but we're doing a theme editor. We're doing some performance improvements to the components, uh, keeping continuing work on making Hilla and React work very well together, adding front end metric support for observability kit, making further enhancements to the SSO kit for Hilla, and then making accessibility improvements to basically all of the UI components. So let's go through each of those a little bit more in detail. With the team editor, this is for flow only uh, at the moment. No, actually it isn't. No, it is, sorry. Yes, it's for flow at the moment. So what it means is that you can, using kind of continuing from the component selector that we added now, you can actually select any component and then you can apply different kind of styles directly through again the developer tools in dev mode so you can you can pick a text box for a text field for instance and then you can choose do i want to make these style changes for all text fields in the application so maybe you want all text fields to have a certain border or something or then just this individual specific one 
And then we kind of, based on that, update the CSS for you. And then also if you pick a specific component, then again, thanks to the component locator that knows where is this component instance defined in Java, we also make an addition to the Java code for you to add a CSS class name in the Java code for that component so that the CSS that we generate can also target that. So in that way, it will be really, really convenient to make lots of, of theming changes uh, to your application. Uh, and this is very much kind of based on customer feedback. For instance, we did a community survey a while ago and, and many of you then said that theming is one of the most, one of the things you find to be most challenging. So the simplified CSS structure with the part selectors that we added here, that's one step. And then the theme editor is, is continuing on that also. Then we're doing a bunch of performance enhancements to various UI components. We have mostly been focusing on, on the grid component based on, on your feedback. So we defined, I think it was six or seven different use cases that it thought we could be improving on and did some benchmark for those. And last week when we, when we had the last uh, sprint review, the team showed that they could improve all of those with between nine and 57 percent performance improvements for those different grid and tree grid use cases like uh, making filtering when tree grid has all items uh, expanded for instance that was one of those that had the biggest improvement but overall bunch of of performance improvements to the components and this then is something that is just as much useful for both flow and hila users then specifically for Hilla, we keep working on, on the React support that we that we added in December uh, and have, have been improving. So uh, there's a bunch of documentation missing. We are simplifying the starters, making sure that things are consistent with best practices for React and, and those kinds of things. We will get a bunch of those improvements into Hilla 2.1 in June, but uh, we, uh, we have one big thing, which is making it really easy to combine with form binding with Formic, which is the most popular form binding library for Hilla. That might or might not make it to that release, but if it's not, then then it's instead for the next quarter release, so, so for September. Mm. With Observability Kit, we are adding front-end metrics. So uh, the version so far, of observability kit, it has only allowed you to, to collect data from the server side part of things. But now we also make it so that you can get observability metrics from what actually happens in the user's browser. So for instance, performance insights, if there's any client side exceptions, those can be automatically forwarded to your observability tooling and, and those kinds of things. This is uh, only for flow at the moment, but we're also considering adding adding something similar for Hilla, but that's that's further out probably. For the SSO kit, uh, we're making a bunch of improvements, mostly for Hilla, uh, adding a client side library so that you can, we provide one liner TypeScript solution for you to immediately check is the user signed in from client side code and so on. You could do that, of course, from from, from server-side code already today. And also we provide in the documentation how you can do it from TypeScript code, but we're just basically making it much easier by providing a library for that. Uh, also for Flow users, we're adding a possibility to use custom roles. So uh, when your SSO provider says that the, this user has some application specific role, then that should also be possible to use from, from the SSO kit, either for, for Flow or for Hila. Final thing that we are working on and getting ready for Flow 24.1 and Hila 2.1 is uh, another round of accessibility improvements for the UI components. So we did one round of this already for what in 21 or 22 or something like that. And now we're doing one more pass, basically going through all the findings. We, we had some uh, consultants, experts in accessibility review 
all our components and we got a long list of things that could be improved and now we are making a bunch of those improvements so basically we are aiming to to make it so that the components by default meet the 2.1 uh, web content accessibility standards uh, level two of those if i remember right of course there's also lots of accessibility things that can only be done through the application but we're at least making sure that you have the possibility of creating an application that live up to all those all those requirements that more and more also become regulated by law both in europe and in the us those were all the improvements all the new things first that we covered in in Vardin 24 with flow and with hilla 2 and then also a sneak peek into what's up next so finally let's have a look at the questions. rest of the questions yeah so we had a question and it kind of was a two-part question um so from charles edward who uh, wondered if there are any updates coming to the flow map component and then specifically noted that it would be good to see auto zoom and center and also support for marker clusters yep um we don't have any specific plans for that it's definitely it's it's one of the things that quite many have been asking for so probably we will doing something about it at some point but we don't have any specific plans it will at the very least not be done uh, for the 24.1 and 2.1 2 releases that that are already well underway in development but after that we will see so uh charles edward i've just um, posted your request into our internal channel for the product team to let them know what you're asking for there and i'll also just post it to our components team just so they're aware all yep. right. Um, the next question from Tomas was, is Tomcat app server supported with Vaden Flow 24? Uh, yes, it is. One moment, I will bring up the table again. So uh, here you see the list of all the, all the application servers that we're testing with. There might also be others that, that are fully supported since, I mean, if, if the application server follow the server specification, then it should just work or relevant versions of the server specification and specifically with apache tomcat uh, we are testing with version 10.1 uh, so that's the one i would recommend that you use also for now all right um next question um on our application is on flow 23 but prior to spring boot 3 can I upgrade to 24 without breaking our code? Uh, you will probably need to make some small changes, but as long as you have, well, when you're using Spring Boot 3, then, then you, if you are actually applying it as a Spring Boot application, then you don't need to worry about the servlet container since Spring Boot 3 basically it uses uh, that Tomcat 10.1 by default. Uh, this is a different person than the Tomcat person. Yeah, but I mean, Spring Boot 3 by default uses Tomcat. So if, if oh, you God, are... I, got it. I see what you're saying. If you're deploying it as a Spring Boot application, you build a jar file, then it will just... Then you don't need to be worried about that part. But if you deploy it to a standalone, you build it as a war file and deploy it as a standalone server container, then you need to update that. So you but, need to update to Java 17 on your server. Then on the actual code level, it really depends. Uh, in the simple cases, most, I mean, most applications, they use JPA through Spring Data. So you have a whole bunch of at entity annotations, for instance. For those, you definitely need to update the imports from, from uh, Java X to Jakarta. But beyond that, in the basic cases, things will just work. Uh, there is at least nothing that we are aware of that would require any big changes. But probably if you have a non-trivial application, there, there will be a couple of places that do need some small tweaks. For instance, uh, Spring security has changed a little bit between, between the previous version and the new one and those kinds of small things. But kind of no features have been removed that would require you to completely re rework anything. So that should at least kind of help you keep the effort 
uh, reasonable. Yeah, but it, it is important to note that you do need to upgrade to Java 17 and Spring Boot 3. Yep. So, so it wasn't explicitly asked in that question, but, um, and then I think Leif is speaking to once you do those updates of those dependencies, there may be some things you have to adjust. Uh, but there is an upgrade guide also. Um, yep. And we did write a blog uh, where one of our developer relations folks, uh, Mati Tavanen, went through a sap sample application and he provides a little bit of hints and, and tips on that. So feel free to check those out. All right, so we have a question now from Norbert. Uh, which framework and which version, Flow or Hilla, is best to use in a cloud environment to get the lowest possible resource use, i.e. CPU and memory? Yeah, so um, which version? That's, that's easy, that's the latest version uh, because uh, that, that's the one that is most optimized and so on. And like I, I showed you uh, one new feature that, that comes now in with Flow24 and, and Hill2 is the native, uh, native uh, image compilation with helps especially with the memory usage. Then the other half of the question, should you use Flow or Hilla? Uh, if you only care about server-side resource usage, then Hilla has a benefit since uh, basically it doesn't need to keep the UI state for each individual user on the server, but that's instead in the user's browsers. So that means that yes, it uses a bit less memory or in some cases, even much more mem uh, much less memory thanks to that. At the same time, in most cases, I would recommend if you choose between Flow and Hila, it's much more about whether you prefer to use only Java or if you prefer to, to use uh, uh, React or Lit with TypeScript for the, uh, for the UI logic. The other thing that might be a factor is the type of application. So, you know, what kind of, do you need a stateless application? What kind of scale for your application are you going to have? Because that could also push you towards one choice or the other. Yeah. And Norbert, I don't know if you have a subscription, but this would also be something you could potentially reach out through expert chat or feel free to um, reach out to us through, for example, um, our Discord channel and ask that question and we can maybe provide you with some more details. All right, um, we have a question from Justice. Is there a plan for auto-generated Hill, Hill a CRUD component? Yeah, okay, so um, with four CRUDs, there's two different solutions. We got the kind of, the component named CRUD it's in the pro subscription. That one provides a whole bunch of boilerplate for you, but you still need to configure it with uh, with kind of what is what what data fields do you have and so on. And then it's based on the uh, grid component, which is uh, in the free tier. Uh, and for that one, then you have much more control, but also you you need to define more things. Uh, and the question here really is, could this be auto-generated? Because, I mean, we're already with Hilla for form binding. We are auto-generating a whole bunch of things because on the server side, based on your Java types, we know which properties there are there. We know what their types are. We know what, what uh, validation constraints they have if you're using bean validation and so on. And we have prototyped making it so that you could also use the same kind of metadata to configure a grid so that you would get one column per, per, uh, per property in that data type. You would get uh, the data types for individual properties based on what you have there and so on. We don't have any specific plan for how and when we would add that to, to heal lot, but it's it's something we have been looking into. And again, this is good good input for the product management team to to consider how to how to prioritize this feature. Thanks, Justice. I'll pass that on. Yep. All right. So we have a question from Alwyn. We noticed that, for example, the CSS under front end slash theme slash components slash vaden combo box dot CSS 
did not have any effect on the Vaadin combo boxes in version 24 anymore. Was this feature removed? Uh, the location of that file means that it's it's part of the the theming mechanism that that was that is still supported, but it's no longer kind of the way we recommend doing things. So that should be supported. I actually I don't remember. Is it so that you need to toggle a property in your theme JSON file to say that it should still keep using those? Uh, we we need to come back with this one, but I think that's the case. But but we will we will come back. With yeah, that. Alvin, you might also want to again if you put that in the Discord channel, um, then people either the community members or our DevRel team follows that can take a look and help respond to that as well. All right, um, a question from I hope you're I'm pronouncing your name right, Gatorm. <laughs> Has anything changed with regard to skinny war, i.e. deploying an ear with multiple wars and having most dependencies in ear-lib? Last we checked in Baden 22, I believe it didn't work. That's one of the cases that I just don't remember. We, we haven't kind of, we haven't built any features specifically for this, but we might have fixed some bugs. But again, I, I don't, I don't remember exactly what the status is with, with that. All right, Discord channel or an issue. Obviously, you can do a GitHub issue as well. Yeah. Um, and then another question from Gatorm. A one uh, selling point for us with server-side button with security, i.e. if we delete a button, it doesn't exist. An attacker can try to fake a click in the browser, but it doesn't exist on the server side, so nothing happens. So I think yeah, this so is more of a comment. Yeah, the, the, this is comment about kind of should you choose Flow or Hilla, and and definitely this this aspect of the architecture with Flow means that it's it's easier to or let's say say it the other way around. It's more difficult to cause security issues by accident, thanks to this way that kind of if you if you again delete delete a button or disable it or something, then already on the framework level, Flow will take care of making it so that if the if there's a request from a web browser saying that hey I want to I want to click this button that doesn't exist then flow will just automatically discard that you don't need to do anything in your application logic to take those kinds of attacks into account so yeah that's definitely one one reason why you might might want to consider flow over hilla because you get that kind of benefit automatically out of the box all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating today. Oops, sorry. We've got one last Ooh. question that came in at the last moment. Uh, Charles Edouard, um, any plan on supporting time zone in charts? Right now it's enabled while charts.gs supports it. I don't know. <laughs> Fair and square. <laughs> That's something we, we would need to, to <laughs> check with the with the product managers and the development team and and come back with an answer. Yeah. And and again, I Discord is a great place to ask these just because obviously we'll I'm passing some of these on through our internal Slack, but uh can be helpful just so that we can track those questions and respond to them. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much everybody for joining. We appreciate it and appreciate the questions and the engagement. Um, yeah, just keep in mind, use our Discord channels to ask questions and get assistance. Also, you know, GitHub issues are a great way to suggest things that you would like to, to see happen. Or uh, I think, is it an issue or a ticket? I don't remember exactly where we take those, but, um, you know, please keep the feedback coming. Yep. Thanks, everybody, and hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you. Bye.